Welcome to Things You Don't Know, the podcast that seeks to bring little-known facts about well-known people and events uh, to light, as well as lesser-known people and the impacts that their actions have had. Sometimes, of course, we just simply choose to entertain or focus on cultural things which may have some impact. Glad to have you with us today. We've got some pretty interesting things to to, to uh, discuss today. And Dr. Deneen came up with this notion, so I'm going to let him introduce this. Okay, thank you, Dr. Weaver. Some Another thing we deal with every day be, besides cleansing paper is money. And we often think of it, take it for granted. We put out our debit cards, cash when we need it. But it's got a larger meaning than just being able to buy whatever we need or pay our bills. It's a symbol like an anthem or a flag of the significant events and leaders in the life of a nation. Yeah, in the United States, our dollars are printed in green, and sometimes we have some other splashes of other colors. However... In Canada, they have some unique, to us at least, traditions relating to their paper money, which they also call dollars, by the way. They change who is portrayed every few years, and each denomination is printed in a different color, whereas here in the USA, we have kept the same persons portrayed on paper money for many years. The citizens portrayed on these notes vary. Today, we're going to explore the life of a hidden, but a genuinely heroic woman. Her name is Viola Desmond. Her face adorns the Canadian $10 bill, which is printed in purple. So it's a purple dollar with her face displaying a quiet pride. Who was she? She was an industrial tycoon very similar to Marjorie Post. We did a podcast on Marjorie Post a while back. Folks, if you haven't listened to that, please do and comment when you can. Ms. Desmond helped to correct a grave injustice and advance, advance the cause of human dignity. Canada has a well-deserved reputation for being a beacon of freedom for those escaping from slavery in the United States young men who didn't wish to serve in the Vietnam War, refugees from the Iron Curtain, and, and many others. Its racial politics uh, were generally less discriminatory and more progressive. However, there were injustices, and this podcast details one. Viola Desmond was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, on July 6, 1914. She was one of 11 children. Her father, James Albert Desmond, was a well-regarded barber. Her mother was the daughter of a white minister and a black woman from New Haven, Connecticut. Now, you may wonder whether this biracial relationship caused her any problems. Um, it may have somewhat in the white community uh, African Canadians weren't really aware. They just would have seen her as having a lighter shade of skin. But it was her father's uh, work as a barber that gave her a lifelong interest in caring for hair. As a young woman, she traveled uh, to Atlantic City to study with the Edna Walker Health Hair Care Salon. That Edda, was the Edna Walker hair salon? Yes. Not Edna. No, Edna with a T. Okay, so could you say that sentence again, please, so I don't have oh. to fuck myself to death trying to yes. edit it? Sorry. As a young woman, Miss Desmond traveled to Atlantic City to study with the Edna Walker Health Hair Care Salon. This was a school created by Madam C.J. Walker, the first African-American millionaire in the United States and the subject of a future podcast. Okay, so in 1940, 
after studying in New Jersey and Montreal, Ms. Desmond opened the Desmond Center for Beauty Culture. Now, beauty parlor owners had a great deal of status within the Canadian community. And they often served as civic leaders. Bill, you had a comment you wanted to make about that. Well, yeah. Um, you know, at the risk of, of somebody uh, jumping up and down and saying that we're being racist or whatever, because um, there are crazy people out there who will jump on anything you, you say, it is true that having um, a successful business, making good money, whether you're uh, African-American, Caucasian, Inuit, uh, Native American, whatever, it does give you a specific status and respect. And if you as a, as a, well, as a group of people in those positions or you individually take pride in doing civic things that also enhances your status. And it did for Ms. Desmond. When she opened the Desmond School of Beauty Culture, she attracted both customers and students, other people who wanted to learn how to use her haircutting methods from all over Canada. By 1943, she was a millionaire and her status as a leading businesswoman was recognized when the premier of Nova Scotia, Alexander MacDonald, personally attended the opening of her fourth branch. And just a word to interrupt you here. Uh, African-American hair is different than Caucasian hair. People were not giving appropriate attention to the very beautiful, lovely, attractive styles that were appropriate for African hair. So her training people was very, very important in the community, in her community, in, in the black culture uh, in Canada and in the United States, as we'll get to in a moment. But yes, there is a difference in, in the hair. And they, you know, rather than just uh, trying to uh, make uh, African-American women um, straighten their hair and be like uh, Caucasian women, she taught ways to treat the hair that was more appropriate and better and very attractive. And also styles which later on in, in the 60s, in the 1960s in the United States, for example, a lot of Caucasians decided to have a fro or an afro, if you will. So, I mean, she had a, a great deal of multicultural impact and that's wonderful. Unfortunately, her great achievements and her peace were disturbed about three years later on November the 8th in 1946, she would go on sailing trips, uh, selling trips rather, um, distributing her goods all over Canada. And her car broke down in a suburb of Nova Scotia, a place called New Glasgow. And she found out that it would take a day to complete the repairs. So she found a hotel room and had a, an evening to kill and decided she would go to the movies. And that's where this crisis began. Now, Nova Scotia was unique among Canadian provinces. It was not the formalized segregation of certain parts of the United States, but they were unwritten and no less real types of it. Houses, movie theaters, bars, restaurants were divided. Uh, some were reserved for whites, some for blacks, and some for the Inuit people that were then known as Eskimos. The theater that Miss Desmond went to served all the races, but in separate areas of the building. Aha. So when she purchased a ticket, Ms. Desmond was assigned to the balcony, but moved to the lower area. An yes. usher, mm -hmm. and then I understand an usher, ordered her to move. And the ticket taker stated, I am not allowed to sell lower floor seats to 
you people. <laughs> what a horrible phrase. Yeah. Okay, so she was removed, dragged out of the theater, which in, in which um, process she had her hip injured and her knee injured. She spent the night in jail after being arrested. A week later, she was put on trial okay, <laughs> and convicted ostensibly for not paying the penny tax difference for a lower seat. Her sentence was a fine, a fine of $26. Now, the unfortunate thing is that even within the framework of the time, this was an illegal proceeding for reasons I'll explain in a minute. A great scholar of Canadian law, Constance Backhouse, mentioned that the legal nature of racial discrimination at that time is very unsettled in Canada. There were two competing principles, an individual's right to freedom from discrimination based on race, creed, or color, and the absolute freedom of commerce, which could be used as an excuse to deny service to people. Neither principle took precedence over the other. No court had ruled on the illegality of racial discrimination in restaurants, theaters, or hotels. Now, what made the proceeding illegal is that there was no jury in panel for the case, and Ms. Desmond was not given a lawyer. So her conviction, which was done before what they call a divisional magistrate, was decried as illegal by a civil rights group called the Nova Scotia Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The NSAACP was founded by the Reverend William Oliver, a Baptist minister and banker who was Miss Desmond's pastor, and they raised money to fight the conviction. The province's most important black newspaper, the Clarion, regularly publicized the injustice of racism and her case in specific. Regrettably, in her case, the appeals process was denied despite the fact that the provincial court judge conceded the justice of her claim, stating openly there is no place for Jim Crow in Canada, but the freedom of association clause in the provincial constitution was held to be absolute. And that meant businesses were not required to serve all people, and that was considered an unspoken form of discrimination. Well, it certainly was. And the, the Canadian Legion and the African Equal Rights League launched a year-long protest, uh, which led to the outlawing of segregation in restaurants in 1952 and public accommodations two years later. Okay, this case inspired a number of Canadians of uh, African descent including a barrister and political political leader, Lincoln Alexandra, who had had a similar discrimination event uh, when he was denied service in a hotel, which inspired him to become a lawyer. Mr. Alexander became the first African-Canadian to serve in the Canadian House of Commons in 1966. He mentioned the Desmond case as an important factor in the creation of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Some of the information we're going to discuss next, my friends, comes from the Encyclopedia Britannica, the, the website of the Canadian Heritage Association, and the book Sister to Courage, which was written by Ms. Desmond's sister, Wanda Robeson. Ms. Robeson had enrolled in a course on racial relations in North America at Cape Breton University. And when her professor, Dr. Graham Reynolds, mentioned the case, she explained to him that he was her sister and wrote a wonderful book called Sister to Courage. It's thankfully the injustice has been somewhat remedied. Ms. Desmond got a posthumous pardon in 2010 and became a woman became uh, featured on a stamp three three a years, two years stamp, later yeah mm -hmm. and and in 2018 became the first black person and the first non-royal woman to ever appear on Canadian currency yeah the new 
bills went into circulation in November of 2018, I believe. And that was quite, quite an accomplishment. Now, kind of going back on our timeline a little bit, Ms. Desmond moved to the United States and unfortunately she passed away in 1965 at the age of 51. I think you told me, Dr. Deneen, that she died of a stroke in her sleep. That, that's correct, oh, yes. What a sad day. Absolutely, because I think a woman of her vision and drive would have been a great asset to the struggle for racial justice, not only in Canada, but around the world. I do agree with you. Well, we could go on uh, about Ms. Desmond, but we wanted to just give a snapshot picture of, of, of her accomplishments and what a great and courageous woman she was. We hope that you will give us a like and thank you for joining us today. We hope you will join us again. We have a lot of good things coming up and have a good day. So long, folks.